Let's start with a simple question. What does mindfulness mean to you, and how do you think it impacts daily life? Mindfulness is deceptively difficult to define, but in my own words, I would say mindfulness is simply being aware of our thoughts and emotions, because a lot of the times these are what lead to action, and in fact, most of our actions, actually I don't know if most is the right word, but a good amount of our act actions are well, subconscious. Uh, that's a great way to put it. Mindfulness does involve being aware of our thoughts and emotions and recognizing how they influence our actions. It's about paying attention to the present moment without judgment. How do you think practicing mindfulness can benefit us in our daily lives? Paying attention to the present moment without judgment. I think that is a fantastic way to describe mindfulness and meditation too what i would ask you this what is the difference between mindfulness and meditation i feel like they're often used synonymously with each other but to answer your question i think that mindfulness or being present being in the moment and not being judgmental about whatever it is that we're feeling or thinking can allow us to how do i say to circumnavigate if that's the appropriate word the anxiety that we might feel about the future because a lot of our concerns tend to come back to that anxiety whenever we feel this whenever we think something bad is going to happen or whenever we think that we're going to hurt someone's feelings or our own feelings you know whatever it may be there's always some ambient level of anxiety. Yes, mindfulness and meditation are often used interchangeably, but they do have distinct meanings. Mindfulness is the practice of being fully present and aware of where we are and what we're doing without being overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. It can be practiced anytime, anywhere. Meditation, on the other hand, is a more structured practice that often involves mindfulness, but can include other techniques like focused attention, loving kindness or visualization. Meditation is typically done in a specific setting for a dedicated amount of time. Your point about mindfulness helping to circumnavigate anxiety is spot on. By staying present and not getting caught up in worries about the future, mindfulness can help reduce that ambient level of anxiety. It allows us to focus on what we can control in the moment rather than being overwhelmed by by what ifs and potential negative outcomes. Do you practice any specific mindfulness techniques or meditation routines yourself? Meditation, no. Mindfulness, yes, based on your definition of the two. And if I understood you correctly, you're saying that meditation is sort of a broader umbrella in which we can practice mindfulness, but mindfulness is not Necess necessary to practice meditation because there are other types of meditation like visualization or love and kindness. Did I summarize that right? And two, your question about whether mindfulness... Actually, I forget your question. I was trying to remind myself. Yes, you summarized it correctly. Meditation is indeed a broader umbrella that can include mindfulness as one of its practices, but there are other types of meditation as well, such as visualization or loving kindness. My question was whether you practice any specific mindfulness techniques or routines. Given that you mentioned practicing mindfulness but not meditation, can you share some examples of how you incorporate mindfulness into your daily life? You know, I wanted to qualify my answer a little bit more when I said that I do practice mindfulness. It's difficult for me to demarcate between practicing mindfulness and overthinking. The two seem to overlap and that area seems so broad that it's very difficult for me to determine which of the two it is and so to that point i do think that i naturally have a proclivity towards being mindful i am naturally attuned with my emotions and my thoughts and in fact to the point that i was just making i might be too much so i might be too consumed sometimes depending on the topic and what it is that i'm thinking about with these thoughts and i guess yeah this makes it difficult i'm not sure if there is some distinction to be made between uh, being mindful and overthinking that might make that boundary a little bit more clearer what do you think about this that's a excellent point 
the line between mindfulness and overthinking can indeed be blurry. Mindfulness is about observing your thoughts and emotions without getting caught up in them or passing judgment. It's a way to acknowledge what you're feeling and thinking without letting it take over your mind. Overthinking, on the other hand, involves getting stuck in a loop of thoughts, um, often accompanied by worry and anxiety. Uh, it can be more about ruminating on problems, potential outcomes, or past events, which can lead to stress and mental fatigue. A helpful distinction might be that mindfulness focuses on the present moment and encourages a sense of acceptance and non-judgment. Disturb overthinking tends to be more future-oriented or past-focused and often involves self-criticism or worry. Um, to navigate this, you might try setting intentional times for mindfulness practices. For example, dedicating a few minutes each day to focus on your breath, observe your thoughts, and gently bring your attention back to the present can help distinguish mindfulness from overthinking. It might also help to practice grounding techniques like paying attention to your senses, what you can see, hear, feel, etc., which can anchor you in the present moment. Have you tried any grounding techniques or specific practices to help with this distinction? In other words, the difference between mindfulness and meditation is whether we're being carried away by these thoughts. I feel like while that might make sense in theory, in practice, it doesn't really work that way. It's very difficult to be mindful of a topic that is provocative or that elicits some sort of emotion naturally and it's and to be judge you know to be to not be judgmental about that to be um to be neutral about it you know it's almost inherent in thinking or in being mindful of certain things that we are going to feel these emotions unless of course you're saying that is an end goal because i can see that being an ideal ideally i would like to be able to reflect on things and my mental state without getting too attached to the emotions but again i don't think that it tends to happen that way and i wonder if you're saying that it's not to be considered as mindfulness if i'm not strictly emo if i'm not strictly detached from the emotions you're touching on a very nuanced aspect of mindfulness it's true that in practice it can be incredibly challenging to observe our thoughts and emotions without getting carried away by them, especially when they are intense or provocative. Mindfulness doesn't necessarily mean being completely detached from your emotions or not feeling them. It's more about being aware of them without letting them control your actions or overwhelm you. It's about creating a space where you can observe your thoughts and feelings with a degree of separation, recognizing them for what they are temporary and part of the human experience. Think of it like this. Mindfulness is not about not feeling emotions. It's about not being consumed by them. Uh, it's the practice of noticing your thoughts and feelings, acknowledging them, and then gently bringing your focus back to the present moment. Uh, it's natural to get caught up in emotions. And mindfulness involves recognizing when that happens and making a conscious effort to return to a state of awareness. It's certainly an ongoing practice and can be seen as an ideal to strive for rather than a strict rule. The more you practice mindfulness, the better you might become at noticing when you're getting carried away and gently bringing yourself back. So in essence, it's not that you're not being mindful if you feel emotions. It's about how you handle those emotions when they arise. Um, do you find that making this distinction helps clarify the practice of mindfulness for you? It does clarify it a little bit more. And I think that to your point, whenever I am being mindful, whenever I'm detached from the emotions, or I shouldn't use that word detached as it implies what you were describing, that it is not. But whenever I, whenever I notice emotions that I don't get consumed by, these tend to be emotions that don't have that much of a judgmental pull. Whenever an emotion or whenever a thought does have that level of of um what's the word that i'm looking for it starts with a v are you thinking of valence valence refers to the intrinsic attractiveness or aversiveness of an emotion so when emotions or thoughts have a high valence either positive or negative they tend to have a stronger pull and are harder to remain non-reactive to it's natural that emotions or thoughts with high valence are more challenging to observe mindfully without getting consumed by them 
Recognizing this can be helpful because it sets realistic expectations for your mindfulness practice. It's okay to find it difficult. Mindfulness is about the effort and the process, not about achieving a perfect state of non-reactivity. When you encounter high valence emotions or thoughts, you might find it helpful to focus on grounding techniques or simple mindfulness exercises like concentrating on your breath or physical sensations to help anchor you. Um, this can create a bit more space between you and the intense emotions, even if just for a moment. Does this approach seem like something that could help in those moments when high valence emotions arise? It does. And I also appreciate that fine grain way that you describe uh, mindfulness and how these different, these variety in emotions can impact us differently as far as being consumed by them. I do think that it's a bit difficult to quantify how much exactly mindfulness is helping whenever these strong emotions come along because it's difficult to you know like naturally we keep regressing back to these emotions as hard as we might try to pull ourselves away from them or to notice them without judgments it's almost like we keep falling into that subconscious rut of you know just remembering what it is that we're trying to avoid remembering and sometimes the very um, the very desire to stop thinking about it or to stop con being consumed by it is in itself something that catalyzes that in the first place. So I think it's difficult to determine exactly how much mindfulness can help with mitigating those intrusive thoughts. And it, whenever those intrusive thoughts do pass away, it's difficult to tell to what extent it was a consequence of being mindful and to what extent it was a matter of just simply letting time pass. You know, I think that perhaps it's not so much even about not being consumed by the emotions, but rather just letting them to do what they will, so to speak, but not, you know, not, um, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like it's possible to notice these emotions and to even be incapable of controlling them as far as how much they consume us and still maintain some sort of a distance from them. You know, just basically reframing our mind around it and recognizing that these are just fleeting thoughts and that we are not our thoughts. You know, we can separate ourselves from our thoughts. Actually, I think that's the central, that, that's the crux of where I'm getting at with this whole monologue that I just went on. But I think it's simply about recognizing thoughts as independent of our identity, recognizing them as just one of many, um, many instances of happenings going on around us. Absolutely. You've articulated a key aspect of mindfulness very well. Recognizing that our thoughts and emotions are not our identity is central to the practice. It's about observing them as they arise without necessarily getting entangled in them. Um, this detachment doesn't mean not feeling the emotions or suppressing them, but rather acknowledging them as temporary states that don't define us. The challenge, as you pointed out, is that our minds naturally tend to revert back to these strong emotions, especially when they are intrusive. It's a continuous process of gently bringing our attention back to the present moment, even if we have to do it repeatedly. Mindfulness can be seen as a practice of creating that mental space where we recognize our thoughts and emotions without becoming overwhelmed by them. Over time, this practice can help us build resilience and a more balanced perspective, even if it's hard to quantify its immediate impact. It's also important to be compassionate with ourselves during this process. Uh, acknowledging that it's okay to struggle with intense emotions and thoughts is part of the practice. The aim is not to achieve perfect control, but to foster a gentle awareness and acceptance. Uh, do you find that this perspective on mindfulness Seeing thoughts as independent of your identity and recognizing the ongoing nature of the practice resonates with your experiences? That's hard to say because of that difficulty that I pointed at as far as quantifying how beneficial mindfulness is. And I'm curious, I want to wrap up on this note, by the way, but I'm curious 
even in the long term, because you said that it, it might be difficult to notice the benefits of mindfulness in the short term because it is something that we need to keep practicing. But I wonder in the long term, is there any better evidence? That's a valid concern. Mindfulness can be elusive in terms of measuring its benefits, especially because its effects can be subtle and develop gradually over time. Long-term benefits of mindfulness have been documented in various studies, suggesting improvements in areas such as stress reduction, emotional regulation, and overall well-being. However, individual experiences can vary widely. For many, the subjective experience of mindfulness benefits might come in the form of small incremental changes. Uh, these can include feeling slightly less reactive to stress, um, having a better ability to focus, or experiencing a general sense of calmness more frequently. It might be helpful to keep a journal of your mindfulness practice and periodically reflect on any changes you notice over time. This can provide a more tangible way to observe progress, even if it's gradual. Another approach is to combine mindfulness with other practices like gratitude journaling or physical activities, which can complement and amplify its benefits. Wrapping up, it's essential to recognize that mindfulness is a deeply personal practice and its impact can be subtle. Continuous practice and self-compassion are key and it's perfectly normal to question its effectiveness along the journey. I hope this conversation has been insightful and helps in reflecting on your mindfulness practice. Looking forward to our next discussion. I want to throw another wrench into that comment, those comments you just made before we end it, but it has to do with how, again, mindfulness is so difficult to quantify. Even in the long term, even if I do notice any changes that are beneficial, how do I know that it is not something else that caused those changes and that it is actually mindfulness? Because there are so many other variables at play from getting used to uncomfortable situations as we keep exposing ourselves to them intentionally or unintentionally. There are many coping mechanisms that we naturally have as humans and, you know, even other animals have those as well that, um, that slowly builds some resilience towards these emotions that are also, you know, targets of mindfulness practice. You raise a very important point. Uh, the challenge of attributing changes directly to mindfulness amidst numerous other variables and coping mechanisms is indeed complex. Our lives are influenced by a multitude of factors and isolating the impact of any single practice like mindfulness can be difficult. Um, this is why mindfulness research often uses controlled studies to try and isolate its effects. But in real life, such controlled conditions are rare. Um, it's true that our natural resilience and exposure to uncomfortable situations can also contribute to the benefits we might observe over time. One way to approach this could be to view mindfulness as part of a holistic approach to well-being. Uh, rather than seeking to attribute benefits solely to mindfulness, it might be more useful to see it as one of many tools that contribute to overall mental and emotional health. This perspective can reduce the pressure to measure its impact precisely and allow for a more integrated view of personal growth. Ultimately, the subjective sense of mindfulness benefiting your life, even if not solely responsible for changes, can still validate its practice. Uh, if you find it helpful, that in itself can be a reason to continue. Do you feel this integrated approach makes sense, considering the complexities you've highlighted? It does, and not to uh, keep pushing this conversation on, even though it's time to wrap up, but I think that to your point, even in the short term, there's been several instances where something happens on the road, which is the more frequent occurrence. And, you know, I get irritated by some driver who does something apparently stupid. And I have to try to reframe this, right? I have to consider that for one, I could have easily done what they did. And because most of the times, what they did is not so out of the, you know, it, it's not so inconceivable that I could have done that myself had I been considering whatever it is that they were considering, which is not always, you know, obvious to me. But yet again, there are other times when I just am able to reframe these events that happen. So like I mentioned, one is to notice that I might do the same myself. And the other is to try to give the benefit of the doubt and to assume 
ignorance as opposed to malevolence, which is a quote that I heard from Jordan Peterson, although he's not the one who, ori who originated that quote. But I think between these two things, um, which I could, I think is uh, reasonable to put under the basket of mindfulness, I think with these two things reflecting on my thoughts and feelings and counterposing these things over them, I am able to reframe my emotions. And even though that's still difficult, I think it short circuits my um my path towards being more equanimous is did i use that word the right way equanimous and also counterpose did i use those two words correctly yes you used both equanimous and counterpose correctly equanimous means maintaining mental calmness and evenness of temper especially in difficult situations counterpose refers to contrasting or balancing one thing with another your approach to reframing your reactions while driving is a great example of practical mindfulness in action. Uh, reflecting on your own potential for similar mistakes and giving others the benefit of the doubt are powerful strategies that align well with mindfulness principles. These practices help in creating mental space to respond more calmly and thoughtfully rather than reacting impulsively. Um, it's encouraging to hear that you've found ways to apply mindfulness in everyday situations even if the benefits are subtle and gradual. This approach to reframing thoughts and emotions in the moment is indeed a form of mindfulness and contributes to a more balanced and less reactive state of mind. Wrapping up on this note, it's clear that even small, consistent efforts in mindfulness can make a difference in how we handle daily challenges. Um, thanks for the insightful conversation. Looking forward to our next discussion. Thank you. It was very illuminating and I hope the viewers got something out of it as usual. I will see you in the next one.